says the spread of coronavirus continues across the country. COVID-related hospitalizations currently at a record high. And we have seen guidance from the CDC and others on how uh, Americans should be thinking about staying safe this holiday season. Joining us now to discuss is Dr. Robert Redfield. He is the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We're also joined by Yahoo Finances Anjali Kemlani. Dr. Redfield, thanks so much for joining the program today. I'd love to begin by talking about the holiday, um, the guidance that, that the CDC has put out, and uh, what you are hoping uh, Americans will do over the coming days uh, to help as best we can stop the spread of COVID right now. Yeah, Miles, it's really important because, as you know, we're in a significant surge right now across the country. Uh, and it is just so important that the American public redouble their efforts to be vigilant on the key mitigation steps that we do know work. For example, masks, we know they work not only to protect you from infecting others, but also to protect you from getting infected, hand washing, uh, social distancing, really being smart about crowds, being really select about activities indoor, you know, try to maximize ventilation, do as much as you can outdoor. And this is why we, we advise the American public, knowing that, you know, this is an important holiday that we really advise people to reconsider uh, about traveling, uh, reconsider about trying to limit themselves to small gatherings of individuals that actually live in the same home. Because right now, the major way this virus is transmitting around our nation is no longer the public square. It really is these household gatherings. Uh, and we have many, 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 many counties now, even in rural areas that are in what we call the red zone. So we're trying to really uh, uh, escalate our message uh, for individuals to realize we can make a difference. Uh, Kansas recently did an, a study uh, where uh, there was a mass mandate and some counties opted out of it, some counties opted in, the counties that opted in had about a 6% decrease in cases per 100,000 in the observation period over approximately six weeks. The counties that decided to opt out of that mitigation step had over 100% increase in the cases. So each of these mitigation steps that we've recommended really do work. Um, I know it's difficult, I have a large family, but I think this is a, a, this is a Thanksgiving and this is a, uh, a religious holiday season that we're going to have in December, where I think it's much more prudent to be circumspect about, uh, about travel, about gathering with individuals for meals that aren't part of your own household, uh, being vigilant about wearing masks, hand washing, uh, and being vigilant about uh, being smart about how you put yourself at risk in crowds. Dr. Redfield, Anjali here, good to talk to you again. I know that uh, you've addressed this already in terms of uh, small gatherings, and there have been some reports that say that it isn't necessarily so. Um, I, I wonder if you could explain, is there a de are there details involved in your saying that small gatherings uh, do trans uh, co uh, contribute to transmission, uh, such as you know ventilation or, or uh, wearing masks, even when multiple people are indoors? Are there, are there steps that can be taken if someone uh, wants to gather? Yeah, I think you raise some important points. Uh, um, clearly, wearing masks is important uh, from uh, everyone in the gathering. Clearly, maximizing ventilation is important. Clearly, match, ma maximizing social distancing is important. A number of people who are having these gatherings are opting to have them outside rather than inside. Uh, even though it's cold with heaters. My wife and I celebrated her birthday last night in a, a small uh, outside table uh, where there was really only one other couple in the, in the, in the outside area, and probably separated by 20 feet. And yeah, we kept our coats on and yeah, it was cold. Uh, but these are the type of things we're, we're really asking people to do. Don't let down your guard. And many people do when they're among family members and you're having a celebration meal together, you're taking off your mask, you're, you're, you're socializing in a close space. This is what we're asking people. If they do do these gatherings, please wear your mask, please social distance, trees, try to maximize ventilation, consider doing it outside if it's at all possible. If not, open the windows and doors to maximize ventilation. 
um, because the reality is when you look at this um, surge we're having across the country, you know, it's not like the spring when the surge was in major cities, New York, Detroit, New Orleans, Los Angeles. This surge is really throughout the counties. We have thousands and thousands of counties now, even in rural states like North Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, where they have very low population densities, but they're having very high infection rates. And again, it is because this virus is moving silently. It's a silent epidemic. Largely individuals 15 to say 35 asymptomatic are transmitting this virus. So I know there are some individuals that try to suggest that maybe uh, small gatherings and household gatherings aren't driving this. I think we're confident that this is where the pandemic is centered now. Um, there's been much more, I think, um, uh, effective attention to the public square where people are being much more careful. I do think people have a tendency to be less careful when in, they're in these uh, uh, small household gatherings in their own home. So we've really made it clear when we're talking about having a household gathering, we're really trying to tell you to limit it to the people that actually live in that household, sleep in that household. And when you're bringing other individuals in, then you really need to be vigilant with like what you said with the mass social distancing, increased ventilation, uh, and trying to be smart about the, the interactions uh, that you do have. Absolutely. Uh, moving on to, uh, we've seen, you know, a, a lot of uh, travel as well. And I know that the CDC or individuals from the CDC conducted a study about uh, travel related spread. And it seems like the results of that have led to a uh, consideration of a change for the quarantine period down to seven or 10 days. I wonder if you could uh, elaborate on that and sort of what the thought process behind this change is. Well, I can tell you, we've always tried to use, as you know, CDC is not an opinion organization. We're a science-based data organization. And, and, and the data that we do have then defines our recommendations. And as you know, um, the, the best data that we had uh, was that uh, individuals, we would uh, isolate or quarantine for 14 days because people that have been exposed uh, could actually become positive for virus um, somewhere between that. Even if you cut it originally uh, at 10 days, you may miss some individuals. Uh, we've continued to study this uh, you know, aggressively in a variety of different settings. Um, and uh, that data is now being critically uh, reviewed and put together. Um, and based on that data, uh, I, I anticipate we're gonna revise our recommendations. So it's, uh, we're constantly you know, doing more and more research to try to validate our recommendations and see if they can be improved. And I do anticipate that we will come out with new recommendations that uh, look at a shorter period of quarantine uh, and even a shorter period of quarantine where you would test out of quarantine. Um, I don't want to get ahead of the recommendations. I know there's been some talk in the press about it, but I, I do expect that in the next week or so that data will be completely analyzed and and then recommendations will be made based on that data. Doctor, in terms of uh, a vaccine, how, how severe will the, do you think the side effects will be to a COVID-19 vaccine? And what should the American public expect when they do take this vaccine? Yeah, I think it's important. I've seen there's a lot of uh, reporting on this recently. Obviously, as the FDA uh, finishes their formal review and issues the EUA, there'll be comprehensive uh, data there related to safety, uh, adverse reactions and side effects. And, and that information obviously will be transparently um, uh, presented to the American public. Uh, our advisory uh, committee on immunization practices will uh, put that together um, along with the uh, recommendations that come from the FDA. Uh, I anticipate so far that this is a relatively safe uh, vaccine. We haven't seen many serious adverse events, as you know. Um, uh, obviously, there are reactions that we see with many vaccines between injection site soreness uh, and sometimes some systemic symptoms of uh, feeling like you have a flu-like illness. But I think let's wait till the analysis is complete and those, um, those data will be presented in a transparent way to the American people. I will say that for those people that are at risk 
uh, for uh, a serious outcome or those people that are at risk for being infected and being a silent spreader to somebody else. I think this vaccine is really uh, going to be a game changer for us in this pandemic. Um, we're hopeful that the American public will embrace it. Obviously, we're going to present the information as clearly and transparently to the American public as we can. Dr. Refield, finally, um, if I may, sir, you sound a little weary, and I think we're all a little weary, but you especially, I mean, this advice that that the CDC and other health professionals have been giving for so many months now about wearing masks and social distancing is not being taken to heart by all Americans or else we still wouldn't be seeing this spread. As we look ahead to future pandemics and to whomever your successor at the CDC might be, what advice would you give them? What what is, is sort of the central lesson we have perhaps learned throughout the course of this pandemic that we can pass on um, and apply in the next situation? Well, it's an important question. I know uh, when I finish my uh, uh, tour of duty, you know, working on it substantially, because I think that's really the key, what lessons were learned so that you can kind of articulate and share that. I think for me, if there's any disappointment is that we didn't come together, I think, effectively as a nation and really hone in um, and reinforce a central message. Uh, mass work, there's no question about it. The science is clear. And yet, you know, I'm sure you can have 10 people get on your show and tell you that masks don't work. Um, and this is, this is difficult, you know, when the American public is trying to understand you know, what message do I accept? I'm trying to, uh, you know, we have tons of evidence. Some of it is, you know, when you're getting a new pathogen as we did, I mean, when it first came, we were looking at this like flu. And so people were assuming that the real target that we had to focus on was symptomatic illness. And then once we had symptomatic illness, symptomatically ill patients should then wear masks. And then all of a sudden we learn wait a minute, this virus isn't like flu. It's not like SARS. This virus actually transmits really well asymptomatically. And then that's what led us to understand that we needed to get source control. And so we needed everyone to wear a mask because we didn't know who was infected and who wasn't. And I think that transition of message from January and February to April 3rd, when we issued our, our mask guidance, uh, a lot of people exploited that and basically put doubt in whether masks work or don't mask. Sadly, that, that issue became politicized. Uh, so what I would say is the biggest lesson that I've learned, it's how critical it is to have unity in message. Unity in message. Unity in message. And you're right, we keep repeating the same message. But I'm hopeful, particularly now as people see what's happening, the spike in cases, we had over a million cases in a week you know, last week. Um, now getting back up to 1,500, 1,700, 1,900 deaths a day. My hope is that people will, will take that message again and realize now, particularly because we have a vaccine that is going to be available starting in a couple of weeks and then over the next months ahead between now and probably the end of the second quarter, beginning of the third quarter of 2021, the American public is going to have the benefit of being vaccinated and we're going to be able to put this pandemic behind us. So it's so important now not to be in the last group that ends up with a serious fatal outcome because, you know, my 20, you know, not eight year old uh, child who works in a hospital comes home and inadvertently infects me and my wife. I think we have to be vigilant now not give up on it. But to me, that's the biggest lesson is, is, you know, if we had unity as a nation of message, uh, using the tools that we have, uh, hopefully we can still get there for December and January and February and sort of rally around the reality that uh, the vaccines are here. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, the Calvary's coming. We're going to get the vulnerable vaccinated. We're going to make sure uh, we start to confront uh, this pandemic and really put it behind us. And then we can turn our attention to helping the rest of the world, particularly resource limited areas, begin to get this pandemic under control for them also. 
Dr. Agrafeel, a final question on that vaccine distribution. I know that the advisory committee um, did recommend that essential workers get vaccinated before uh, the elderly, and, and it seemed to make a lot of uh, health equity uh, advocates very happy. Uh, but then we heard Secretary Azar yesterday say that it was really up to the states. Uh, where do you stand on this, and what can we expect in terms of actual distribution? Well, we're still in discussions, as you know, to make the uh, f final recommendations that we will have from CDC. Um, and uh, what has been determined, as you know, and as Secretary Azar and Pro Operation Warp Speed have probably articulated the other day, is there is a distribution to each of the 64 distributions, uh, 64 jurisdictions that is going to be done based on the amount of vaccine we have based on population size. But the micro distribution, once that vaccine is within those states, clearly CDC is gonna give clear guidance. And as you mentioned, whether it's healthcare workers, first responders, whether it's the most vulnerable, whether it's strategic in trying to uh, maintain healthcare resilience, obviously individuals in nursing homes, those, those final recommendations will be forthcoming shortly. But at the end of the day, the vaccine is going to be delivered to these jurisdictions. And what I call the micro distribution plan will be executed by the individual states based on how they finally decide to do it. CDC sent a, out a playbook back in July to have each jurisdiction, 64 jurisdictions, start to figure out how would they distribute this vaccine to their population. They worked on them. They completed them by late September, early October. We went back and forth to make sure there weren't any gaps. And so each of these jurisdictions do have a plan. Um, that plan may be modified based on the final recommendations from CDC, um, but ultimately we're gonna, the decision on exactly how to distribute this vaccine will ultimately be made um, by the individual states as Secretary Azar said the other day. But we will be giving uh, our, our recommendations how we believe this vaccine should be distributed at this moment. Uh, and I expect those to be forthcoming shortly. All right, Dr. Robert Redfield, the director of the CDC. Sir, you've been uh, very generous with your time this morning. We really appreciate you joining the program. Have a great Thanksgiving. Yeah, God bless you all. Be safe. Thank you.